my conception, how I was brought into the world, even though horrific and terrible and evil, like you don't know the plans God has for that life. And in my opinion, uh, all life is sacred. Shout out to all young people in the pro-life movement, or not in the pro-life movement, but thought to defend life, thought to speak about abortion to your friends at college. It's a really tough thing. It's a really tough thing because even if you get to move the needle a little bit, often people will come back with the very question that you will hear over and over and over again, that is, what about rape and incest? At LifeSite News, we are very pleased to know Rebecca Kiesling. She is a great pro-life activist, has been for a long time, but when everybody got to know her first, it was actually over this very issue of rape. She's a, she says, a product of rape, but she's also a very beautiful, very successful lawyer. And that has so shattered the image of what people think of when they think of rape and incest and what happens to the mother who experiences rape or incest. She's run an organization called Save the One, which talks not only about uh, women who have been raped, but also the other side, women who have gone ahead and kept their baby, who were in a situation of rape, and those who have killed their babies through abortion and the suffering and torment that comes with that. She has brought us to so many heroes sharing their testimonies of keeping life after rape and incest, of being the children of those who were raped. And we're pleased to bring you one of those stories today. His name is Stephen Van Holland. You've probably seen him on a live action video, which went crazily viral. Stay tuned for this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. Stephenson, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Let's begin as we always do with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Stephenson, if you can, just tell us, first of all, your story, just a summarized version of your story. Yeah. Well, uh, when I was eight years old, I had some friends of mine at school come to me and say, you're weird and different. And I'm like, that's not very nice. What are you talking about? And they said, well, you're the wrong color. And I look at my hand as an eight-year-old little boy, and I'm, I'm like, you know what? I've never thought about this, but I am a different color. I, don't, I wouldn't say the wrong color. That's not very nice. But I looked at my hand. I said, well, I look different than the rest of my family. They were white, and I'm biracial. So needless to say, I had some questions, right? So this little eight-year-old boy comes home, and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed with my mom that, that night. And uh, I really didn't want to talk about it because it, it, I was hurt by what they said. But I had a mom that was kind of nosy and in my business, you know. And uh, so before I laid my head down on the pillow, I've, I've told her exactly what happened that day. And so then we have this conversation of I found out at eight years old that I was actually adopted. So um, she told me that at seven days old, they brought me into the family as a seven day old child. And as a matter of fact, I was on the same bottle of formula I left the hospital with. Um, my legs were drawn up into my body. I was very malnutritioned. Uh, they told me that, um, they actually told the family that I probably wouldn't survive, that I just needed a safe place to come. And what I didn't know is two years prior to them bringing me into the home, they had actually had a miscarriage and they had lost a 22-week-old little boy. So God used that pain of their loss to start foster parenting. So they had four biological children. Now, this is kind of funny to me. The, the four biological children, two boys, two girls, was Ricky, Rod, Renee, and Robin, and then there's Steventhon, right? You would have thought if I didn't recognize the color was different, maybe, you know, like I never thought about my name being different. But what I like to say is, you know, people ask me, how did it take eight years for you to realize your skin color was different and all these things? And I think love goes deeper than DNA. Love goes deeper than color and uh, blood, right? So the reason I didn't know those things is because I was showered with love. So a uh, very loving family, but if I'm being honest, uh, that's the first time in my life I ever remember feeling broken. Um, it's the first time in my life I ever remember asking God why. Um, you know, obviously, why, why do I have to be the wrong color? Um, why do I not look the same? But what really hit deep was why would a mother not want her son? I felt like I was thrown away. Um, that I wasn't worth enough to be kept. So 
that little eight-year-old boy, right, is struggling with that. That's what I'm facing. And, you know, you fast forward um, middle school and high school. Um, I didn't want to be weird and different anymore. So I've been 200 and none of your business pounds since seventh grade, okay? So I was a fullback and middle linebacker, uh, baseball player. Uh, sports became the way that I, I could find identity and worth. Like, I'm going to hit you really hard if you want to talk, you know, tell me I'm weird and different. Um, so, you know, my, my junior year of high school, I actually had a back surgery, uh, ended my football career. I felt like I, here I am again asking God what, why. God, I thought, you know, I was going to be playing in college somewhere. So I actually, because of that, I, I walked on. I went somewhere I didn't expect to go. I went to a little small school in Bristol, Tennessee, um, about four hours from my hometown. And long story short, I played baseball, earned a scholarship, but I really I think God had me there for one reason, that's to meet my wife. Uh, I'm married up, literally. She's 5'11", and I know I'm sitting down, but, you know, I'm not that tall. Um, but she was from Tampa, Florida, a volleyball player. We met, and uh, we started talking about what, what would a family look like, you know, uh, if we get married, and do we want to start early? How many kids do we want to have? And now she wanted like 16, you know, and I, I was, you know, I, I, anyways, we have four. <laughs> uh, but we get married in June of 2006 in Tampa, Florida, her hometown. And uh, very early on, I was, I was a minister working with youth. And um, my wife was pregnant with our first pregnancy. And eight weeks into our pregnancy, she had a miscarriage at home alone while I was at church working with our students. I come back home and find her in the floor, doubled over in pain. And, you know, here we are both asking God, what, why? And uh, so we've lost our first baby. We have a successful pregnancy, who's our 16-year-old daughter today. Uh, our third pregnancy, 10 weeks in, we, we have another miscarriage. So we've lost another baby. Uh, this time she had to have a DNC. So it's had to have it surgically removed, uh, lifeless baby in the womb. And so she went into the doctor's office with a baby in the womb, but came back to me with an empty womb. And for this dad's heart, it just ripped me apart. I, I went into depression. Um, I'm asking God again. I'm mad, frustrated at God, like why? Um, but in the middle of that pain and that brokenness, we're on our fourth pregnancy. So we lost our eight-week-old, had Isabella, who's our 16-year-old, lost our 10-week-old third pregnancy, and then we're pregnant with Eliana, who's our 13-year-old. And I'll go ahead and tell you we have another daughter. Notice no guys. It's just me alone. <laughs> Uh, three daughters and my wife, um, but in the, with the fourth pregnancy, in the, in the middle of that pain and depression, uh, just the Spirit of God said, it's time. And I'm like, it's time for what? I need more information. It said, it's time to look for your mom. So from eight years old to 27 is where I find myself in 2009. I had all these questions, right? Why, why, why? Why would my mom not want me? And they're about to be answered. Um, when I was eight years old, having that conversation with my mom, there was a moment where she gave me a folder. It was eight pages of typewriter paperwork. So I had my birth certificate, and I had seven pages of family information. And I took that paperwork and started searching on Google. And three days into the search, I found a man named Steve Holt. He's a magician and ventriloquist from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Now, what's significant about that is my birth mom's name was Glenda Sue Holt. So the last name matched. But I don't know if, I know you all don't know me. You don't know me super well. But I don't like clowns. I don't like Chucky, It. You know what I'm saying? They freak me out. This man is a magician and ventriloquist. I didn't want to be on this man's site, you know? But something inside of me said, keep looking. So I look on his bio, and every single name on my paperwork from 1982, I was born March 31st, 1982, matched what his... Uh, online information said mm -hmm. and one specific name was Glenda Sue Holt who his, is a baby sister and that's my mom that's my mom's name mm -hmm. so I, I sent him an email and uh, then we do a phone call and sure enough at 27 years old I met my birth uncle I flew from Tampa to South Carolina to meet with him about a month later and uh, he actually told me how I came to be which I did not know and the story is that um, there were six kids, so he's one of six, they, um, their parents died at an early age and they were all thrown into orphanages. Um, all of them except for him are mentally handicapped, including my mom. 
So my mom only functioned as an 11 year old mental capacity. So when she aged out of the system, uh, she, she actually became a ward of the state of Georgia and was placed into a mental facility. And while she was there, she was actually raped by five men. Uh, we don't believe it was staff, it was outside of the facility. Uh, but she gets pregnant with me. And, but here's the thing, she's 18 outwardly, but she's only 11 mentally. So does she even know what happened to her, the trauma from that? She definitely didn't want to tell anybody. So it was some time had went by before the facility realized that she was pregnant. But when they found out, this is a state-ran facility, she has no resources, no job, no family, they were pressuring her every day to abort her baby, right? Because, you know, again, statistically, she didn't have the resources, uh, she couldn't care for me. But um, this woman that I call my hero, uh, she valued life enough, even with only an 11-year-old mental capacity, to fight for me. So those questions, you know, for years that I had, like, you know, why, why, you know, did she really love me or care for me? She fought for me and she, she carried me homeless, uh, ran away from this facility literally on her own and fought for her baby. So for the duration of the pregnancy, she's on the streets and by the end, she's nine months pregnant, living in a cardboard box behind an old grocery store in this little country town. It's in Tennessee. Uh, called Whitwell. If you're from there, they say Whitwell. But guess what family lived there? Only the grace of God, right? The Holland family that had four kids, Ricky, Rod, Renee, and Robin, and they were longing for one more baby boy. And God placed her in that town behind that store in that box. And the 16-year-old boy was skipping school one day up to no good. He saw the box move, pulls the box back, Here's this my mom pregnant with me, nine months pregnant. He loads her up, like walks her home to his family. So this is a 16-year-old boy, 18-year-old, nine-month pregnant girl, walks in the front door and says, hey, mom and dad, look what I found. Can we keep her? <laughs> so can you imagine, you know, like your 16-year-old son walking in with an 18-year-old pregnant woman? But they said yes, and they cared for us for two weeks until she gave birth to me in the hospital. And everybody wants to know, like, Stephenson, like, where does that name come from? She gave it to me. Um, she said, I want to name him Stephen, then William. So William is my middle name. And whoever heard audibly her speak the first name, they put Stephen, then together. So it's S-T-E-V-E-N-T-H-E-N. So I find all this out at 27 in, in my uncle's living room. But the story's not over yet. Then he looks at me, and it kind of gets awkward and silent. And he says, I want to tell you something. He's like, your mom's alive and she's five hours south of where we sit right now. And he asked me this question. He said, do you want to meet her? And what the Spirit of, of God had spoken to me was, a couple months before that, it's time. So we jumped in the car the next day. I wanted to go right then and there, but it was at night. And we drove five hours uh, down to this mental facility that she was living in, uh, kind of like a nursing home situation, men on one side, women on the other. We had this plan of, of interacting and meeting in part like in her room but God just kind of took over and we had a video camera rolling my uncle did a magic show for the residents to kind of to lighten which was really hilarious because you had schizophrenics and they were nonverbal and he's he's putting bottles through people's bodies and <laughs> I'm just saying it was it was weird right and they, they were freaking out but it kind of lightened the mood and there was a moment where my mom started singing a song and so I'm a, I don't, I'm a worship leader, singer, songwriter. And she gets done singing, and it didn't really make sense. You know, in her 11-year-old mind, she's 46, but she's still 11 mentally. I just felt led to come sing Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. And I started singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved. And I, I lost it, started crying, because this woman that I'm looking at literally saved my life. And then she finishes the verse like every word perfect, on point, on key. And then my uncle has the honor of actually introducing us right there in that moment while the camera's rolling. So there's actually a video on YouTube of, of me, you know, me meeting my hero, uh, Mama Glenda, for the first time. Beautiful. Let's, let's take a look at that. The family that you gave him to to take care of, their, their last name was Holland. So his name is Stephenson, 
William Holland. Tell us now, after that incredibly moving meeting, what was the answer in your heart from God? Would you say the answer to the why question? Mm -hmm. I was at peace just to have the opportunity to look my mom in the eyes and tell her that I loved her and thank you for giving me life. That, that, that's all I needed. And I would have been at peace with that, but God, I think, gave me so much more um, that I was loved, that I did matter. Um, she looked at me, you know, in that video we just watched, she looked at me and said, I love you, son. I would have never given you up if I could have kept you. She wanted me, right? But she just didn't have the, re the mental capacity to care for me. But she did have the love, right, to give birth to her son. Uh, she valued me enough, even though the world was telling her that it wasn't worth it and she shouldn't have to go through that. Even with an 11-year-old mental capacity, she knew the value of life and the strength of a mother, right? She truly is the hero of the story. This normally is the poster child for abortion. These are the cases that... Planned Parenthood goes, International Planned Parenthood goes from country to country in all the countries where abortion is illegal and brings out these cases. These young woman, young girl who's raped, should she be forced to carry that child, wreck her life, and so on. What, what's your message to young people who are plagued with that mentality because that's what they get all day, every day. This is the horror situation. What is the situation for real? Um, my response to that is I matter. <laughs> my life matters. You know, I have three beautiful daughters that are here because she chose life for their dad. You know, that my wife has a husband that she loves and supports because of choosing life. And a lot of people, you know, on the front end of that, you didn't know what my life would look like. You didn't know the story I would have uh, that I matter. You know, so the, my conception, how I was brought into the world, even though horrific and terrible and evil, like you don't know the plans God has for that life. And in my opinion, uh, all life is sacred. And hopefully I can be an example of that with my story and be bold enough to share. I tell people I have to touch my pain a lot of times, every time I share, I shed tears, but I know somebody watching this is maybe gonna find healing. And that's part of the purpose that I have on this planet that I was given, right? Because somebody saw value enough to choose life for me, even though the circumstances were not great. Tell us what you know of your mom's sentiments, feelings, even though they're, they're of, a, of a minor, you might say. What are those, and how does she feel God has touched her life amidst what would have been, what is an unspeakable crime and horror? But tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I actually uh, lost my mom on Thanksgiving of 2020. She passed away, um, but I had 11 years with her, and she met her daughter, her granddaughter. They call her Gigi, Grandma Glenda. Um, Every time that I would walk into this facility, I would drive seven hours to visit her. And every time I walked in, you know, I'm her son. She recognized that, right? And she, she loved me and she hugged me. And we had this beautiful moment, you know, with moments that we got to share over that 11 years. So I, I think, um, and again, with, with her granddaughters, she, you know, she died at 57 years old, but for 11 years, they got to color with her, got to play with baby dolls 
I mean, because she was an 11-year-old child, right? But she literally got to play with her grandkids. And I'm thankful for that, right? Her, her, her life had worth and value, even though a lot of society would say, well, you know, she only functions as an 11-year-old. She's mentally, you know, handicapped and challenged. But she's somebody's mom, and she's somebody's grandmother, and she, lo- she deserved to be loved and respected. People say God can write straight with crooked lines. What does that statement mean to you? I think you would say it that way, and I, I'm from the country, okay, so I grew up in Tennessee. I would say my crap has become my fertilizer, you know? So maybe that's, I, I'm thinking, so let me answer it like that, okay? Uh, we don't like to have the crap dumped on us. We don't like to have the crooked lines. We want it to be straight, but sometimes that fertilizes the soil so the roots can grow deep, and then there's a tree, and then there's fruit, right? Is, is that too much imagery yeah, for us? Great. But I, I think of that. I mean, that's just what came to mind. Like, my wounds have become a weapon, right? Um, the brokenness that I carry uh, have become the beauty of the object. As Christians, we believe that all of life is about eternal life. The world, our lives here are testing ground to get to heaven. That, it, that is the purpose of our lives. It's very short compared to eternal life. In fact, it's like the blink of an eye. In that blink of an eye, you decide which direction you're going to take for all eternity. The, what people think is immense suffering here is all about getting there. Jesus said, sounds horrible. If you love me, take up your cross. Not take up a good drink, come in the shade with me, and we'll just have a great time. It's take up your cross and follow me. So we have to deal with a lot your testimony is very powerful because it, it brings to the brink of what people think, how could you ever endure that? It's the cross in, in real, real terms. Why do you call your organization Broken Not Dead? Um, the name came from really my, my own suffering. My, you know, I'm broken, but I'm not dead yet. There's still purpose for my life, right? Second Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 is the verse where we see, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not abandoned. You know, I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. Not yet, right? So to me, that's a battle cry uh, for anybody listening. You may be broken, right? But brokenness is not death. And I think the best way an image to, uh, I, I use a lot is kintsugi. I don't, have you ever heard of kintsugi? No. It's a Japanese art form of mending broken pottery. So maybe, maybe you've seen like where it has the gold and the cracks. So kent sugi means to repair with gold. So it takes a master potter, right? That, that they've, they've crafted the skill for years. So that'll speak, right? It takes a master potter to mend the brokenness. So we have to take that brokenness and surrender it to the master potter to do the healing. But once you've been restored, right? The beauty, the cracks become the beauty of the object. So, so you actually do have purpose, even though you've been through the brokenness, right? You, there's still purpose for your life. You're actually worth more. That object's worth more now than it was in its original state. But it had to be broken, then restored. But my favorite part is what happens when you shine a light on that object that wouldn't have happened before it had been broken and restored. It reflects the light, right? So where is the, the light reflected from? The broken places. Hmm. right the the cracks and the scars so I I feel like for the image people out there in the world that's what this means yeah I'm broken but so what I'm not dead yet so I still have breath in my lungs and a heartbeat in my chest so I still have work to do I still have eternity right we talked about to push towards and bring as many people as I can with me I'm going to end off with a very challenging question for you Stephen you've got your own kids what are you doing to bring your own kids to the ultimate in life? Um, I think I'm trying to be the greatest example as a father and a man of God, you know, as an example to my kids to, you know, to bring them along with me, right? That's my first ministry is my family, my wife and my children. So uh, it's a beautiful, I mean, you know how to get me crying. Um, To see my girls lead worship with me, to sing with dad. Right, they're singing because of their love, you know, and their faith and their love for Jesus, right? And um, and to see them serve in the church, and um, 
you know, they'll be the first to tell you, even pro-life, they're passionate about pro-life and they're passionate about their faith. And, you know, that's a testament to hopefully the work that I've done and my wife have done as parents. So um, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's an honor to be called dad. One last edgy thing. Uh, Stephen is a musician. What's your band called? Stephen Thin Holland. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. May I ask you, I don't know if you know it, but um, just a verse of um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Do you know that one? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. <laughs> That's all I've got. Beautiful. Stevenson, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you all. Through this man, we were able to turn our eyes upon Jesus and for a little while look full into his wonderful face. Do that, my friends. For LifeSite News, this is John Henry Weston. And may God bless you.